Well, hello, Doug and I are here um, to talk about uh, Elon and OpenAI and other topics. And it's Friday, March 8th, 2024. But the first thing I've got, there was an article on Bleeping Computer that said a um, Flipper Zero can steal a Tesla. And then they had to sort of apologize. Everybody complained and said that headline was misleading. Well, in fact, any web server can steal a Tesla. All you have to do is do a man-in-the-middle phishing attack, um, get them to connect to your Wi-Fi, and then you can get their password and get in their web account. And um, so you have to, I guess... Now, I'm I'm actually... Unfortunately, Bleeding Computer is down now, and I can't see the page. But I'm not quite sure why normal anti-phishing protections don't apply here. So I'm going like to go back here and see more why this is possible, because normally... Um, the HTTPS means it's not that easy to fish you. Um, but anyway, they get your password, they get in your online Tesla account, and then they can steal your Tesla. So, uh, people so, so say it's this not, is important. Yeah? Yeah, it, it's an attack against the website, not yeah. the car itself. Right. We should be clear on that, yeah. Right, and apparently once you're in their online web account, you can then authorize your way into a car. But but you, I think you'd have to send them a fake link which is probably what happens. So um, it's just, it sounds like sort of a traditional or standard phishing attack. It is. It is. I mean, I think it must be somehow click, tricking them into clicking on a, a fake link, which was not clear in the original article. Anyway, um, in principle, you could do that with a Raspberry Pi, although I, people say it's really not as exciting as it sounds. Anyway, um, let's go on to you. What have you got? Oh, let's see. So last time we talked about using emails for uh, passwords. Yeah, that and, was something Steve Gibson recommended. Yeah, so Steve Gibson came up with that. Sounded like a, a good idea until in practice we found out that maybe it's not such a good idea. Microsoft has been implementing it. Yeah, well, here, let me tell you some of the failures. Taco Bell has implemented it. And let's say you'd like to pick up something at Taco Bell. So you're driving in your car, you pull out your phone, you pull out the app. Oh, wait, I need to get an email. I Not only to get into the app, I got to get an email. So now I got to make a request. And oops, oh, I just missed that car there. So my point is that sometimes it's not as easy as one might think. Well, I'm... I, I'm going to push back because I have a huge problem. This happens to me. It seems like about one quarter of the time I open an app on my phone, it yeah. says, oh, you need to log in with the password. Now, I don't have the password except on my home device. So now I can't use that app until I get home to get to my password manager. If it was just go to my email, I'd be a lot better off. Well, here, the, uh, the other thing is, I, I don't understand this, but there are people who do not have email on their phone. It seems like that would be the first thing you'd have. I mean, I, that's what I would think too. The only thing I could think of is maybe they're carrying a corporate phone and that well, phone number. Yeah, well, I, now, I, well, now there, I think we touch a real important issue. You know, yeah. I, I remember uh, back in 2016, I saw a woman at Safeway with two phones and I told her she'd run for president because that's why Hillary lost because she didn't carry two phones. And um, I'm, I'm now in that position. I've got business and home stuff on the same phone, and it does lead to weird problems. Uh, logically, carrying two phones would probably be a better plan. Yeah, you know, I worked for organizations where I had to carry three phones. My personal phone, a phone that was part of the corporate network, and then a special phone that was part of the department that I was working for. And we had to essentially gap everything to keep everything separate. Yeah, you know, if, if uh, this goes on, I might start carrying two phones because I mean, they made me put an MDM profile on it. And right. now I had to have like six-digit profile, six-digit pin. And then I had to put a six-digit pin on my Apple Watch. And then they busted me for having TikTok on it. And I said, well, I hadn't thought of that. But it's it's getting Much to be a little inconvenient and weird to have corporate and personal stuff on the same device. Yeah, much easier to keep it air gapped, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah it's it's right. more more of a hassle. You have to carry two phones. You have to carry yeah. two chargers. 
But there are times also where I have to carry two or three laptops for the same reason. Yeah, yeah. Air gap everything. It's it just it may sound more complicated, more of a hassle, but it in the end it's simpler, I think. Yeah, Any, anyway, yeah. so this password email, you know, thought to be a good idea, which it sounded like. We're finding repercussions. And yeah. what I was trying to explain is if somebody a lot of times you're driving, <clears throat> you want to order something. So it turns out kind of jokingly that this might be a win for Chipotle because you can use their app without having to use a password um, from email. So people might be ordering from Chipotle rather than Taco Bell. Mm -hmm. It's easier. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they can't get the password. Well, the I'm not meaning, yeah, meaning to place an online order. Well, you know, everybody has their own workflow. That's right. That's right. So I think um, it's looking like this might not be the greatest solution. Well, Microsoft is big into it. So we'll see. Yeah, but it, they use the Authenticator app, don't they? I do not think so. Maybe it might be two factory authenticator, email plus authenticator. It could be. Yeah. And the authenticator, you get a bleep that comes up. You open the authenticator. You have to authenticate to your phone again, That's even true. though you've already authenticated. But the main but, thing is you don't need to know a password, which is a big, right. big improvement. Right. Which means also you don't have to type the password. That's what I really want to avoid is typing the password yeah. on the screen. Yeah. 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 So you got a story for us. What what do you have going? Well, there I do a couple of little ones. There's okay. a um, a device. GitHub has a thing called under new management, which we are installing Chrome, and it will tell you when your Chrome extensions have changed to new management, which is quite valuable because yeah. criminals do buy them and then they put malware in them. So that seems like a good thing. I know there's there's various reputation scores on the internet, like they'll. Like uh, I've heard Steve Gibson talk about this. If you have an HTTPS or code signing certificate, they will judge your reputation to decide whether you look suspicious. Like if that certificate has only been out for a couple of months, then that's suspicious or so on. So this is a good idea. And I think it's part of implementing zero trust. Everything you use, you should consider how suspicious does this look? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so so, so we could we could use AI in there, couldn't we? You certainly could. Yep. And, and right now, I think it just uses a simple uh, tree of if statements for Boolean logic, but in the long run, AI might be better. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a similar security risk of uh, VMware sandbox escapes are now so critical, they're patching their end-of-life products. So if you're using VMware of any kind, you ought to be patching it. Um, and this is something students always ask me, is it safe to analyze malware in a virtual machine? And I'm always, well, there are some escapes, but they aren't that common. Well, I guess they're getting more common. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah, at, at first we thought it was safe, right? Well, there's a risk, but there's always yep. some risk. But yeah. I said, uh, you don't have to worry about that. But well, maybe you should worry about that. Maybe just like the phones, it would be safer to use an air gap, to use a separate computer yeah. to analyze your malware. Just yeah. a little more yeah. hassle. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. Yeah. All right. So, what you got? Yeah. You know, okay. I've got another one here. So, not really tech related. Well, it is tech related, but, you know, Voyager One, this is yeah. kind of interesting. It's uh, becoming end of life. It's getting a little faulty, uh, buggy, and predictable. Yeah. But ironically, it's still out there. It's still flying, right? And, well, but coasting. Here, <laughs> yeah, coasting along, I should say, right? And its nuclear power supply is kind of dwindling down. They turned the heater off. And yeah. I believe it was 1999. Boy, hard to believe. 24, 25 years ago that that blue dot picture was taken. That famous one pixel. Yeah. And Carl Sagan kind of came up with a nice little epitaph that said, um, you know, everyone that you've ever known has ever been. Your leaders, good, bad, every war that was started, long, long epitaph about it was on that little blue pixel, that one little speck. So uh, what's noteworthy about this is, and <laughs> I can't believe this, but when they launched Voyager, nobody kept a copy of the operating system. Right. And now <laughs> it's defective and they can't really like reflash it. 
Yeah, yeah. And what's kind of interesting is, you know, we talk about, we complain about the internet is slow sometimes and round trip communications time. Well, right now it's 45 hours yeah. to send a command to the Voyager and get a response back. Well, we haven't developed FTL communication. We need to get up, catch up to Star Trek. Yeah, right. We need faster than the speed of light, don't we? Yeah, it would be handy. We'll see. A anyway, it's it's just kind of noteworthy. I think uh, Caitlin has brought up that there's a Navy satellite that people forgot to put an on and off switch on it. And that's uh, still up there. It's still fully functional from, yeah. I think, the 80s. Yeah. But the Navy is no longer using it. Uh, so they can't disable it. There's no way to turn it off. You could send a missile at it, but then we have more debris, more space well, debris, no. and we don't want to do that. That's another problem. Yeah. So I think if I recall what Caitlin said is that the uh, drug lords are using it as a repeater. Oh, I heard this years ago. Yes. They, yeah. that, uh, that even also peasants in like Mexico just found like leftover satellite dish parts and used it to make their own cell phone by bouncing signals <laughs> off a satellite. <laughs> Pretty good idea. I mean, yeah, br brilliant idea. It's open to everybody, right? There is no crypto or uh, yeah, no cryptography used. It's it's just an essentially an open repeater. Whatever comes in gets relayed out. Yeah, just like a ham radio repeater. Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, interesting uses, but it just goes to show what we weren't thinking about. We weren't thinking ahead. Yeah. With either one of those. But but I'm surprised that there's no no copy of that. The other thing that's really interesting is, do you know what they use for memory storage? No. They used a, essentially a tape recorder. Oh, that's right. There's 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 actually plastic tape. Yeah, yeah, cuz rolling through at absolute zero for near it. Yeah, 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 a cassette tape, if you will. Not real. It's not um, obviously. It's a specialized cassette tape, but how long has that been going? Seventy. Yeah. So that's what 50, 60 years. Yeah, I wouldn't think it would last. You know, I used. Uh, I heard about early FTIRs, Fourier transform infrared spectrometers, and they just had a bar of iron that would yeah. get magnetized. But I guess that wouldn't have enough data storage. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So they'd have iron bar, and they'd put the bits on the bar. Well, it was analog. That was yeah the, okay. Make an analog copy, and the point is, you could do sweep after sweep, like aggregating the signal to get rid of the noise onto the same. Bar. I see. I it was an analog accumulator. <laughs> yeah, you know, interesting how far technology has come, isn't it? Oh yeah, I just saw some pictures yesterday of us at the Computer History Museum, which is very interesting. Yeah, so much yeah. interesting technology to get where we are. Yeah, 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 and and a lot of that technology. By the time it was created and and put into production, it was obsolete. Well, Some cases. Well, I know you can say stuff is obsolete, but the ideas are out there and there'll come a time when you want to use it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, what do you got? What's next? Well, there's an article. I don't know if I should believe this or not. An Info Security Magazine claims that they're looking at the edge and they can tell that cybersecurity professionals are moonlighting as criminals at night an increasing number of them, and they call for like higher salaries for cybersecurity so they won't have to do that. Um, pen testers, prompt engineers, and web developers are working at night getting jobs as criminals. Now, I've heard of this periodically in the business, people that are white hat by day and black hat by night, but it's hard to believe very many people would do that. It seems like such an extremely risky, unwise thing to do. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I would say just like anything, immigrants coming, there's some criminals, but there's some criminals amongst us in society. Yeah. Anyway, so, I, I yeah. was I was very interested to finally hear another story about Elon Musk because you know Elon Musk was an early investor in open AI and then he suddenly broke with them and his story sounded so self-serving it's hard to believe that he did it for moral reasons because they weren't going to be responsible enough with the technology. And now oh, he sued OpenAI, claiming that they breached a contract where there wasn't any contract. Um, and so they, basing on some emails from them saying they were going to like leave this up open source, and then they didn't do that. And he says, you breached a contract. So they responded by publishing his emails, and they finally exposed the real story, which is the most cynical, 
one that some of my friends suggested, which is what goes on with Elon Musk? Is he invested in the company? And then pretty soon he said, well, I want to take over the company. Give me full control. I'll invest some more money or we'll just merge it into Tesla. And if they don't go for that, then he'll take his money out and storm out to like starve them. So that sounds much more realistic explaining why he left. So this is true capitalism. Yeah, and that sounds like Elon. Because remember, his friends say Elon really believes this is a simulation. The whole world is just a video game, and he is the only real player. All the rest of us are non-player characters. So he has to be <laughs> at the center of everything. And if he's not at the center of everything, it doesn't matter at all. Yeah. And this is something I think the rich and powerful have always believed with this latest science fiction justification in previous generations, they would just say, I was chosen by God to be the king and everything should be about me. There's always a reason why everything should be about me. <laughs> so that's, so that's interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So now the truth comes out, right? Well, that's my feeling. There's two stories and who knows exactly which one is right. But the second one sounds a whole lot more believable to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'd be interested in is Rivian just released a, a demo or a preview of their new EV car, and what's ever everybody's going to the Tesla standard for the connector. Well, yeah, because of the yeah. power station uh, infrastructure. Well, no, it, well, part of that, but the other part is, have you seen the size of the fast charger, the nozzle, if you will, that you have to plug into your car? The no, thing I weighs, thought, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. The, no, I it, thought it looked about like a gas pump, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's the size of a gas pump, but it's got a really thick cable. You got to twist it around, and yeah, you know, if you're not that hmm. strong or that not that able, it's not that easy. Hmm. And uh, you know, the the Elon connector, which works both for uh, home charging as well as DC fast charging, is like a plug. Oh. Right. You, it's it's much smaller. The cable's a lot lighter weight and the diameter of the hole that you need to attach into, if you will, is about the size of a dryer outlet or stove outlet at home. It's not that much bigger. The DC fast charger that's in all the other cars in the Bolt and the Ford and the Rivian and all the other American cars use this for DC fast charging, this very large connector that's got a drier size hole, but then it has two more lugs for the DC fast charging. So it's this big thing that's bigger and bulkier than a gas pump. I mean, how much, you know, gas knows. How much current is in there? Is it really need a special heavy cable? <laughs> well, I, you know, it's American engineers. We over-engineered it. And then, and then just to make things more complicated, you have an, another connector that's called Chadmo in the US. So there's Chadmo, there's Tesla, and then there's a J1772. Well, this is the you, way things always are when they're new. You have a bunch of competing standards, and then hopefully one of them will win out. Yeah. But what's interesting is going back around 2017-18, uh, Elon said, you know, my connector is available. Anybody can use it. No strings attached. But I think there was something, if you do some modification, you can't retain uh, or, um, ownership or royalty of it. It has to be open source. That was kind of when the open source was movement was going around. But most of the, all the American car manufacturers said, nah, we don't want to do that. And same with Korean, Japanese. But here, here's the thing that's brilliant about Tesla's connector. And maybe people aren't aware of this. When you charge from home, it's an AC current that's going into the car. And you've got the inverter or, or the charger circuit that's in your car itself. And that does the conversion, yeah, the rectifier from AC to DC. Mm -hmm. Now, when you charge with a DC fast charger, that's DC current that's going in direct to the battery. Mm -hmm. So it's not AC. Now, you look at Tesla, and that's why you have to have this big connector. You have the smaller one on the J1772. The small one is for AC, for charging at home. And then you have these two, if you do a DC fast charger, 
you don't use those connectors, but you use these large lugs that are below it and you have to open up a special port to plug the, the larger DC fast charger cable in. Right. And then your DC fast charging. Right, now DC is low voltage, so it's got to be high current, right? So that would take a thick it's, case. It's high voltage, high current for DC. How high? The batteries, I, I don't know the exact voltage, but I believe they're 400 volt batteries. Oh, I had no idea. Oh, you didn't know that? And they're talking, I believe, about going to 600 volt. Those things are dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So in the car, you've got your standard 12 volt battery for the radio, for the lights and everything, the electronics. Yeah. And then you have the drive motor batteries, which are 400, I think 480 volts, something like that. So let, let me just finish this thought. So the CHADMO connector is also like the American standard, the J1772, where you've got low voltage connectors plus a high voltage connector. So it's these massive, if you will, these large connectors that you need to plug into the car. Tesla has this dainty little petite connector you plug in. And, I, um, and with that, what's interesting about it is the car will accept it as both AC and DC. And what Tesla did is there's some very clever circuitry that can detect if the incoming voltage is AC or DC, and it knows how to flip it in the car to accept DC fast charge or to run it through the, inver uh, the power supply so that you can get a, a DC voltage out of it. So, you know, Tesla was very clever. They're a technology company that makes cars. Yeah just like Rivian does, whereas the Fords, the GMs, the Chevrolet, I don't even know if Chevrolet's making a, I mean, uh, if Chevy Chrysler's, Volt. yeah, yeah, Chevy Volt, but I don't know if Chrysler's making electric vehicles. VW, they're all using this other connector. Yeah. Right? And instead of the brilliance, but they're car companies trying to do technology. Yeah, well, that was the whole thing about Tesla, is they actually applied modern technology to this industry, which is you know, like Uber, this is, you can do a whole lot of things better if you abandon the old traditional stuff and take new techniques. Yeah, it and it again, it's it's very clever, and a lot of people don't like Tesla, but you have to give him credit for what he's done. Everybody loves the cars, and also yeah. SpaceX. SpaceX is awesome. That's what I mean. Yeah. The thing about Elon Musk, he's very very annoying, but he's accomplished a lot. <laughs> it's not it's How? not just all bad with him. Yeah, it's true. And the and the, the end of the day, it's nice to know he's a true capitalist and he's after money. Yeah, that's true. I can't really fault him <laughs> for that. Yeah. No. So so much for the good of everyone, right? Yeah. Well. <laughs> All right, you guys. So you know a lot about EVs. So it's kind of exciting. The Rivian's coming out. Um, I will say that somebody just posted a picture of the cyber truck that's stuck in the sand in a beach in Santa Cruz. Well, I see so much hatred of the cyber truck. People get so mad. Yeah. You know, it's, it's now the, I think the tagline or the meme that's going around is that cyber truck is, is, uh, is a status of failure. It's a status in the, well, you know, uh, that in the boring company. I mean, sometimes it's stuff. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. But you know, Tesla or Elon has had some failures, Yeah, but I got to tell you, I think he, he, compared to most people, most companies, he's more on the plus side than the minus side because sure. most, most, yeah, most products fail. Well, sure. Apple had their Lisa. Microsoft had a bunch of flops. It's just the way yeah. it is. Yeah. 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 Apple had their Newton. Remember the Newton? Yeah. I had one of those. That was promising. It worked sort of. Yeah, I, an I, Apple I, camera. <laughs> well, you know, I always liked Clippy, but I never saw Microsoft Bob, which is the ecosystem it was part of, which was yeah, a huge I never, flop. yeah, that was a big flop. So Microsoft has had their flops, and well, as we talked a couple episodes ago, Apple just uh, discontinued their car, they the self-driving car. Spent right, two years working on it and just abandoned it. So I guess that's a flop too. Although yeah. it's much cheaper to abandon it before you bother manufacturing and sending it to customers. True, true. But, you know, it would have been interesting if Apple were, was in that race 
with Elon and yeah. with Rivian. And and I think those are the two leaders right now. Would you agree? Well, it sounds good. I don't know the exact numbers, but that sounds good. Yeah. 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 Rivian yeah. still has more than a year backup if you buy one, right? Which is oh, you know, people put up with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, every few months there's talk that Rivian doesn't have any money. They're going to go bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, they're nobody, hanging in there. Nobody says you, that about Tesla. They're rolling in the dough, I think. <laughs> yeah, that I don't know. But there are stories of the quality of the Tesla going down. Yeah, but the money stays up because Elon stays in the headlines. It's a meme stock. It sells at about 10 times its actual value just because of Elon's personality. So his <laughs> staying constantly in every headline is a stock market move to have more money. So this is kind of a joke. No news is good news or bad news is still good news. And it's still raising its stock price. Absolutely. And I think, <laughs> you know, remember when I was a kid, it was J.R. Ewing was the man you love to hate. Um, but I think I think Donald Trump showed that you can make become a huge success, even if like two thirds of everybody hate you. Just making everybody talk about you all the time is enough to make you famous and make you successful. Yeah. Yeah. Even if most of them hate you. <laughs> There's a lot. Right. And not a good one. <laughs> yeah. So right. Elon, Elon, I'm sure, will remain in our headlines as we go forward. Yeah. You got another story for us. Yeah, so um, there's an infographic from uh, Patrick Garrity. I'm not quite sure who made this thing. Maybe he made it, but it's, it's very interesting. So, yeah. in fact, I guess, let me see if, gonna, if I can share my screen here. Uh, share screen. Okay, I'm hoping to find that. There it is there. So here's the infographic. And these are how many vulnerabilities in the wild were reported by um, by different companies. And the highest one is CISA and the shadow server is almost as big. Here's Google, Project Zero, Palo Alto, and Microsoft are the big players. So I hadn't even heard of shadow server, but apparently they're really big in this. I knew Microsoft and Project Zero were big, but CISA, I didn't know they were that important. So anyway, I thought that's really very interesting. Over 20 years, 1965 vulnerabilities exploited in the wild reported by these guys. So, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, you know, um, I'd expect to see some other companies here. Well, but this is, that. yeah, um, where's Cloudflare? Oh, I don't think Cloudflare reports vulnerabilities exploited in the wild hardly at all. I've never seen Oh, oh okay, okay. They just report, you know, problems on their own network. I mean, they I see, hacked I a see. lot of the web, but they don't do vulnerability research and publish, you know, a threat actor is doing this and this. Yeah. And anybody from Europe or is this just U.S.? Uh, I, well, I see 40 net, but I, uh, I don't see a European company. There's Akamai. You know, they all look like U.S. companies, but I think this probably includes Europe. But I think Europe is just a small player. Like here's Cisco, here's Twitter, here's Trend, Juniper. Yeah. No, but I think that's yeah. the whole internet. You know, America dominates outrageously, and Europe is small fry. Yeah, and just out of curiosity, just above Apple to the right, down in the bottom there. Yeah. Who, who Who's the eagle there? Boy, I don't know. I guess it looks like U.S. federal government agency. Yeah, yeah, Maybe it NSA looks that way to me. Yeah. yeah. Not CISA, a government agency where this really isn't their primary activity. Yeah, that's an interesting... And is this... So this is rough 1965 vulnerabilities over 20, over 20 years. years. Yeah. yeah. I guess the company is Volncheck that did this. Which yeah. Which pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting. Yeah. Just anyway. Be, it'd be more interesting to see if we went back over five years, I think. Yes. I think it would be different. Even one year. It'd be interesting. Even I one year. Oh, definitely. The CISA has yeah. only been around for like two or three years. I've only been hearing about them doing things. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 But they they're really active. Number. I really like CISA. I think they're a huge leap forward in the U.S. government helping us with cybersecurity. Yeah. Yeah. So you got another story for us. I do. Uh, just an article. Bloomberg has an article about Microsoft Bing maintaining China's Great Firewall. And I was very interested to read it and really like many other things, I like Microsoft. I mean, Google tried to expand into China and China hacked them and they got mad. So they left. Other companies left. Microsoft stayed and they they agreed to filter 
the politically forbidden topics in China and said, we're going to cooperate with them. We're going to obey the law. They've even got good at guessing what they're going to complain about and removing it before they ask. And other people say, you're evil. You're helping China do evil things. And they say, well, you know, our search engine is the least filtered option in China. And it's very popular and people learn a lot more than they would without us there. So that's exactly the argument. I mean, should you uh, have high-minded principles and refuse to tolerate the government of China because it's so totally evil? Or should you accept their rules and play there. I kind of prefer the second. I wish we were on better terms with China. I think it's insane to imagine that the U.S. can preach morality to China and sway them into our morality. That is not <laughs> going to happen. I mean, right. like the flea and they're the dog. I mean, realistically, it would be better to cooperate with them as to the extent you can. I mean, if they actually order you to kill somebody, then you can complain. But if they order you to filter the internet... I mean, they could make a very good argument that their filtered internet is better than our horrible, unfiltered internet full of malware and porn and stuff. Um, in fact, we're filtering ours more and more. Now we want to ban TikTok. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's not at all clear that China is wrong to filter the internet more. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's interesting social experiment still in progress, right? It is. And I mean, China certainly has a lot of human rights abuses, but, um, we have them too. And, you know, I just think we we do not have this high and mighty attitude where we're career and perfect and you're ignorant savages. That's sort of like Elon Musk. That's the natural tendency of every culture to think we're perfect and everybody else is inferior. And when you reach that conclusion, you really ought to step back and say, you know, I'm probably not able to make that judgment fairly. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. In interesting. It, you know, I, I don't have this on my agenda, but I'll just bring this up in California. It was announced that students no longer have to learn their math tables. Oh, you mean multiplication tables? Or yeah, mo mo yeah, multiplication tables. So in school, public schools. Yeah, well, I, I guess I don't know how important that is anymore. It's an interesting issue. I would think yeah, it, so without knowing that you would be ignorant about how numbers work, but I'm not sure. I would tend to agree with you. I noticed and, one thing when I'm teaching my classes, the students that have just come out of high school, they don't read at all. They go to my page of instructions. They look at the picture. They click randomly on the screen until they see something like that. And one guy was getting everything wrong. And I said, no, you have to actually read the instructions and look at what you're supposed to click on. And this was like a light bulb going off. Oh, you actually read the instructions. It had never occurred to him to read the instructions. Well, Sam, you know, late last year, um, there was a, uh, well, this has been known for a while, but at a Columbia University, they had an institute there of teaching children how to read. And it was called the whole language method. There was a woman by the name of Lucy Calkins who came up with that. And there's been research over the past 30 years that has shown that it's completely ineffective. And Maybe that's stu it. Yeah. studies have shown yeah. that over the past 30 years, that the students who graduate, about 60% are functionally illiterate. Well, I have seen a huge effect that a lot of, I thought it was because perhaps the English was their second language, but I no. have a large number of students that cannot read instructions like technical instructions, click on this, scroll down, click on that. And it's incredibly difficult for them to do that. Yeah. So I'll tell you the, the basic premise behind this whole language learning method is first you start reading the sentence. If there's a word there that you don't know, you try and look at pictures or you look at other things that are, you know, uh, uh, that you can see in the page or surrounding sentences to try and figure out the word. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what the word is, you guess. And if you can't guess and it doesn't make sense, then you just ignore the word and read on. Well, you know, so, I, when I, when I, we had some Hungarians in my lab and I was in grad school and they didn't speak English very well. And one guy told them, whenever you don't, someone asks you a question and you don't know what they say, just say yes. And there were various hilarious consequences for this. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sam, I, I, I was in foreign country and, for a while and we'd order you know lunch or dinner or something like that and i'd say you know i'd like a, a pizza and to the table would come a salad yeah and i'd say wait wait i ordered a pizza and they go yes yes that's right 
So then they would take the the salad away and I'd say pizza and they say, yes, yes. And they come back with a bowl of soup. Well, there you go. Yeah. So we, we learned that you just ordered and you just accept whatever you got because it's not worth arguing. Yeah. So they won. <laughs> yeah, they won. All right. They won. You've got a couple more. I've got one more. This is a follow-up. So we talked about John Oliver and uh, pig butchering. Yeah, pig butchering. Thank you for bringing that up. So I was kind of curious. Um, the Heartland Tri- Tri-State Bank was pig butchered. And there was mentioned by John Oliver that the uh, president or whoever, I guess president of this Heartland Bank is going to, I guess, be going to jail. Sean Haynes over this whole pig butchering. And what happened there is um, the bank just one day closed, they were insolvent. The bank opened the next day under a different name and people were, their funds were covered under FDIC insurance. I got that right, didn't I? Yeah. The, the, yeah. Wow. So people didn't, lo- <laughs> yeah. So people didn't lose money, but I would argue you and I lost money. That's our taxpayer money. Sure. It's covering that. Yeah, he essentially um, defrauded the U.S. government. Yeah, so he technically didn't defraud the government, but what he did is he, it looks like, from what I've read, and I've got a Justice Department link there, that he stole the money and invested in cryptocurrency yeah. and lost it all on a pig butchering scheme. This is not that different than what FTX did true except this is a bank right yes. oh, oh it you mean to be bank yeah <laughs> but this was a bank this is a well, bank yeah. that and banks are supposed to be regulated in particular there's limited in what they can invest in they can't just take your money and invest it in dangerous garbage <laughs> well apparently that's what sean haynes did well and it's a crime he... right now he's in time yeah, yeah it's a crime <laughs> and he had been president of the bank for about 20 years from what i've read well, that I think is is like what I keep thinking of as the most important lesson is don't think you're immune from this. Everybody oh. is vulnerable. You can be rich, you yeah. can be smart, you can be educated, but still somebody can trick you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to follow up because uh, the John Oliver story, and for yeah. those, if you didn't tune in to a previous episode, yeah. it's John Oliver, Pig Butchering. Take a look. It's about a 20-minute segment. It goes through how the pig butchering works. And interesting, I didn't know this. It was Chinese casinos that were shut down during the pandemic. I had not heard of this. And now they've gotten into uh, tra- human trafficking, where they have people saying, come here, we're going to give you a job. They'll go through four rounds of interviews. And then they come, they fly to the country, they get picked up. And then they're essentially human trafficked into pig butchering schemes. Yeah. Well, I think... Um... It's really important to know how vulnerable people are. Yep, yep. And it it's still going on. And, you know, most of these crimes aren't reported. Yeah. And it's it's estimated right now that it's $9 billion last year, $10 billion this year. Well, I just saw an article that said, uh, for the first time ever, crypto fraud has now exceeded business email compromise as the total number of billions of dollars stolen in a year. Wait, run that by me one more time. Crypto investment scams are yeah. now the largest single category of fraud for the first time exceeding business email compromise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. And we know a couple of years ago that that um, scams, email scams, crypto scams, his um, th- it's more profitable for the drug cartel than it is selling drugs. That was a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I think this is uh, the bottom line has always been insecurity. The technology is not really the point. The humans are the weak spot. And uh, yeah, yeah, you you can you can buy firewalls all day, but it's the human frailty that is your number one risk. And and here you have this guy in this Heartland Tristank Bank. Yeah. Right. Sean Harris. Yeah. Or Sean Haynes. Sean Haynes. Yeah. Correction on that. All right, you got another one for us. No, I don't. I think that's nope. it for today. That's it. Yeah. See you on Tuesday. Yep. I'll do another one on Tuesday. Very good.
are. 